Philippians chapter 3 verses 8 through 15. I want to talk to us today on a very important topic. If you've been in our church for very long, you've heard me talk about this a number of times over the course of the years. But I feel instructed of the Holy Ghost to once again preach in this vein. Philippians chapter 3 verses 8 through 15. And the King James text today reads as follows. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dumb, that I may win Christ, and be found in Him, listen, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings, being made conformable unto His death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded, and if anything, and if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. If you bow your heads with me one more moment, Father, once again, God, we come before you in prayer. We humble ourselves, O oh God. I humble myself, O oh God, in your presence as one that is called to this office, this ministry. I understand today, O oh God, how imperative it is that the anointing of the Holy Ghost rest upon the speaker, the man, the woman of God. Lord, nothing that I might say could be of any help or benefit to God's people today or any day outside of the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Let your Spirit rest upon me. Let your Spirit rest upon every word I speak. And even as it goes forth, Lord, uh, minister to the heart of the hearer. Help them to understand, O oh God, that that which they hear is indeed from the Word of God. And it is indeed today, Lord, approved of by the Holy Ghost. I know what the speaker and the hearer, for we need you in this hour. We need to hear from heaven. We ask it today, O oh God, in none other but Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. I want to talk to us for a while today on the topic, the perfect deception. The perfect deception. From the beginning of time until this very moment, the enemy of the human soul, Satan, has sought to deceive men and women, boys and girls, human beings. He has sought to convince us and cause us to believe something that is contrary to God 
and contrary to the plan and will of God, contrary to the word of God. In the beginning, he deceived Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, causing them to question whether or not God genuinely said, In the day that thou eatest of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt surely die. Well, God meant what he said. <laughs> mm -hmm. He doesn't talk just to be heard. He means what he says in his word today. And we need to understand His Word. But you know, there is so much being taught, so much being preached, so much being said and disseminated within uh, the Christian church today, my friend, that is not accurate at all. It is, in fact, a deception. It causes you to believe something contrary to what God has said and what the Lord has declared in His Word. It is amazing how much we hear from preachers' lips that has nothing in the universe to do with God, has nothing in the universe to do with the Word of God. It is crafted it is created by human beings who manipulate and they deform and transform the Word of God until they make it appear as though the message they preach is scriptural. I've said it before, I'll say it again. Just because you preach from the Bible does not mean that what you preach is biblical. Amen. A lot of people open their Bible at the beginning of their message and they read a scripture and then they proceed to deliver a word that has nothing in the universe to do with the teaching of God's Word. I can pull any passage I want out of the Word of God, and basically, if I pull it out of context and take it alone, I can make it say anything I want it to say. The Word of God declares line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. You cannot preach a message from one passage of Scripture that contradicts and stands in contradiction to other areas of God's Word. No, all of your message has to come from a total of God's Word. It has to come from the complete Word of God. It all has to come together until it is in perfect harmony. And the problem with, uh, you know, I, I used to be one of those preachers. God help me, I hate to have to admit it. But I used to be one of those preachers who could take a passage out of context and preach just about anything, you know, that come into my head. And I thought every passage in the Word of God stood alone. That, it, you know, it had its own message. Each verse and each line had a message in it. No, it does not. Not by a million, million miles. The Word of God declares within the context of the law of Moses, God declared to Moses, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. And that principle is then repeated in the New Testament. In other words, in order for something to be established as true, it has to have support elsewhere. Nothing stands alone by itself. Nothing. God says nothing in one place that it is not supported and it is not elsewhere endorsed by the Word of God. No. Everything has to have support. It has to have structure. I'll tell you, Satan has been in the deception business since the beginning of time. He wants us to believe something contrary to what God wants us to believe. In the instance of human beings, he 
wants us to believe today that we can be perfect and that God's desire and His plan and His will for us is that we be perfect. After all, they'll pull a scripture out of context that says, God speaking, that says, Be ye perfect even as I am perfect. Well, that's all well and good. The only problem is the word that is translated perfect in the King James is not the word that we use in modern English uh, and that we uh, define as perfect, meaning sinless or without fault or without blemish. That is not what the word in the original text means at all. In fact, the word that we see in the King James, which is translated perfect, comes from a word which literally means mature or fully grown. In other words, God is saying, grow up, be an adult, don't be a child. You know, mature for heaven's sake. How many people live their lives and they will have the mindset and the emotional makeup of a child and they're in their 80s. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I just lost a family member who was in her 90s and still thought and acted and felt in many instances like a little stinking four-year-old. It was insane. I used to used to drive me crazy to try to deal with this particular family member because it's insanity that they could be as old as they are and yet still be so immature. But that is what the word perfect means. It means fully grown, established, mature. Many people in the church today have come to believe that they have attained godly perfection. This deception then leads to their behaving in any number of ways that completely conflict with true Christian living and the manifestation of the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, these things are seldom demonstrated by people who have bought into the lie and the deception of their own perfection. Mm -hmm. To love the sinner in spite of their sin, one must be able to honestly acknowledge, listen to me, that they themselves are not perfect. Mm. You hear me? You cannot love a sinner... You cannot love a sinner in spite of their sin unless you can acknowledge that you yourself are not perfect. Right. The minute you buy into the deception that you're perfect, all of a sudden you give yourself license to look down on others. Mm -hmm. You give yourself license to hate others and to despise others right. and to dislike others, mm -hmm. which if you were in fact perfect, you would not do, my Lord. The most dangerous lie and the most prolific deception that is alive today within the church community is the false notion that one has achieved perfection or holiness. Many say with their mouths that they acknowledge their imperfections, but the true thought of their heart is demonstrated in the way they behave and the way they conduct themselves. Talk is cheap. If they really believed what they professed, that they were not perfect, their conduct would be entirely different. Am I telling the truth sure today? Would. Yeah. The Apostle Paul said in our primary text today, in verse 13, cha uh, chapter 3 of Philippians, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. He said, I don't claim to have arrived. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. You can't allow your past mistakes. You can't allow your past sin. You can't allow your past faults and failings to hold 
build you up. You got to forget the past. Forget yesterday. And move forward. Hallelujah. Paul said, this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. See, I can't move forward until I forget what's behind me. Oh, I'm going to tell you, I've got things in my past, I'm sure many of you do as well, that if you contemplate them and think about them for too long, you'll become so depressed you want to throw yourself off a cliff. When we remember some of the foolishness we've engaged in, when we remember some of the hurt we have visited upon others, when we remember some of the foolish and idiotic ways we've reacted and responded to certain situations, it's maddening, it's sickening, it saddens us. But Paul said, I forget those things which are behind and reaching forth unto the things which are before. He said, I reach for it. He didn't say, I lay my hands on it. He said, I reach for it. Listen to me now. He said, I press toward the mark. I press toward the mark. I see the trophy up ahead and I reach for it and I push for it and I run toward it. He said, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul wrote the majority of the New Testament and yet Paul says I'm not foolish enough to stand here and tell you that I have achieved. Mm -hmm. I'm not dumb enough to stand here and tell you that I have arrived. Oh, but I'm telling you, I know a lot of Christians and I know yes, a lot yes, of preachers yes. and I know a lot of churches that will tell you because they wear their sleeves this long and they wear their dresses that long and they wear their hair this way. Oh, they've reached it, baby. They've arrived. They're there. Now I can look down on the homosexual. Now I can look down on the drunkard. Now I can look down on the drug addict. Now I can look down upon the unbeliever. Now I can look down upon that person who isn't in the church like I am. Yeah. Wrong. Mm -hmm. If you were as perfect as you claim you are, you would not even have the thought to look down upon anyone because godly perfection would cause you to love everyone. Mm -hmm. Tell it. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 3, the Apostle Paul writes, For I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man, the measure of faith. Paul writes that we ought not to think more highly of ourselves than we should. He said we ought to be able to think soberly. To think soberly, one must have clear vision and a clear mind. Am I telling the truth? <laughs> when you're not sober, you don't see clearly. You don't think clearly. But when you are sober, you have clear vision and a clear mind. We must be willing to weigh ourselves against the Word of God. And we must willingly accept when there are areas in our lives which fall short. Anyone who cannot see in themselves weakness, failure, even sin, is destined for a fall. Mm -hmm. This then is the reason that Satan enjoys deceiving believers into thinking more of themselves than a sober self-examination would reveal. Understanding, accepting, and appreciating the grace of God in our lives, which compensates for our weakness, our faults, does not prevent us from striving to do better and be better. 
we must pursue perfection, although we know in truth that outside of the rapture and the resurrection of the body, we will never attain it fully in this life. Doesn't mean I can't try to be the best I can be. That's right. But at the same time, I know I'm never going to be the best I can be. I'm only going to be the best I can be at the moment. Hello now. I can strive to become a better cook, studying, educating myself, practicing my skills. All the while, Tommy, I know that I'll not likely ever become a Chef Wolfgang Puck. But just because I may never become one of the world's most premier chefs, I should not be slack in my efforts to be the best cook that I can be. Right. And who knows? I may one day actually be as great a chef as Wolfgang. But I pursue daily to be better at my craft, to do better at my skill. I do not pursue daily to be as skilled as the world-renowned chef himself. Do you hear what I'm telling you today? In Hebrews 12, 14 through 16, those of you watching, those of you familiar with the Pentecostal holiness movement, this passage, of course, is highly familiar to you. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright many have been false led to believe listen to me that they can possess holiness or perfection in this life through the misuse and the misinterpretation of Hebrews 12 and 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness. Paul is literally saying to the Hebrew church that there are two things you ought to pursue or follow. What are those two things? One, peace with all men. What's the other? Holiness. Without which no man shall see the Lord. What must you do in order to see the Lord? You must be in pursuit of peace with all men. You must be in pursuit of holiness. It doesn't mean you have to be in possession of either or both. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, him. All right. It means that you must be in pursuit of both. Paul said, I have not yet apprehended. I haven't laid my hands on it. But I reach for it and I press forward toward the goal. Hallelujah. The term follow in the Greek is dioko. To run swiftly in order to catch a person or thing. To run after. To press on. Figuratively of one who in a race runs swiftly to reach the goal. Therefore, Paul is saying that we ought to run after, we ought to strive for peace with all men and holiness. There are people who live their lives and could care less about being at peace with other men. There are people who live their lives and could care less about living a godly, holy life. Mm -hmm. Paul said, no, 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 no. If you're going to see the Lord, you've got to at least be in pursuit of these two things. Right. Mm -hmm. These have to be two things that are always in your radar. These have to be two things that are always in your vision that you're always pursuing. Hello now. I know when I lose my temper, or when I get aggravated with people, when I have a bad reaction to something that someone says or does, and I chew them out, you know, and I read them the riot act, I walk away and most often I feel terrible, I feel miserable because I'm not 
at that moment, I'm not following peace with all men. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. And I'm disturbed and I'm disappointed by the fact that I allowed my goal, my desire to be at peace with all men. I allowed it to slip away from me. But God says that's all right. As long as you're in pursuit of it. Hello now. Doesn't mean you have to lay hold of it every time. It just means you've got to pursue it. You've got to run swiftly after it. Most people today will gladly acknowledge that it is not possible to be at peace with every human being. On the planet, there's always someone somewhere who's going to be at odds with us. Mm -hmm. They're going to be offended by us, so they're going to be angry with us. The Lord had enemies in spite of the fact he went about doing good and never did anyone dirty or treated anyone unkind or maliciously. He still had enemies. Mm -hmm. Does that mean he failed in his pursuit of peace with all men? No, because the enemies that was on them, it wasn't on him. Am I telling the truth right. now? Mm -hmm. Same thing with us. There'd be people who want to have trouble with me, want to have a problem with me. But I got news for you, honey. It's on you. It's not on me. Because I'm not running around being malicious and mean spirited. I'm not running around talking dirty about you or trying to do you uh, bad or wrong. It's on you. Yet these same people will falsely embrace the notion that holiness or perfection is somehow attainable. Yet the passage that we've just read does not tell us to attain it or to possess holiness or perfection, but rather it tells us that we must follow, we must run after, pursue both peace with all men and holiness. These two things ought to be our goal as children of God in spite of the fact that we know full and well they will not be attainable until the Lord has redeemed His people and transformed us into His likeness. But if we do not even pursue these things, we have no hope of ever seeing the Lord, which is the ultimate goal of all believers, mm -hmm. as I recently preached, if you remember, from this very pulpit. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 8, the Apostle Paul writes also to the church at Philippi, Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Paul states here that God's people should Look upon one another as being better than themselves. I'm going to tell you, when I look around the Riverside Church of God, when I was at Riverside, honey, there wasn't a person in that church that I couldn't honestly say I felt like was a better believer than I was, that lived this thing better than I did. I held everyone around me. I do this in, in about every church I've ever been a part of. I hold people around me in the highest esteem. I look up to them. I admire them. I appreciate them. I, I, I'm not looking for faults and failures. And when I do see them, I have a bad habit or a good habit, one, of explaining them away. Because I don't want to see faults and I don't want to see weaknesses or failures. 
in my fellow believer. Am I telling the truth today? Mm -hmm. Paul states that we ought to look at one another as being better than ourselves. This is not a matter of self-deprecation, but rather it is an issue of appreciation of others. As we exalt those about us, we maintain within ourselves a much needed sense of humility. The people of God are to possess the mind of Christ. The Lord God Himself, as God, understood that He could come to earth as God. But, if His purpose was to be served, it was necessary that He manifest Himself in a more lowly and humble fashion, which He was willing to do for the purpose of bringing salvation. Humility is not optional for believers. It is essential. Mm -hmm. The opposite of humility is pride. And pride precedes a fall and destruction. A humble heart, even if it were perfect, would never claim to be perfect. Perfection itself would include and encompass humility. And therefore, a perfect man would refuse to declare or acknowledge himself as perfect. <laughs> there were some folks from the Riverside Church ago. There were so many people there that I just did. Oh, I, I honestly, I'm not even joking when I say everybody in the church, as far as I was concerned, knew how to live this life better than I did. I, I love the people of that church so much. But there was one couple, brother and sister King, Tommy met them some years back. They since have gone on to their reward. Brother and sister King, I'm going to tell you, two of the sweetest, most godly human beings I've ever met in my life. I, 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 I wished I could be like them. Like brother and sister Gillum, they were just the most loving, compassionate, sweetest people. You couldn't, I don't think you could get a, a negative word come out of their mouths if you put it in there and pulled it out with a string. You just couldn't get, they, they wouldn't say nothing bad about nobody, no way. Just the sweetest people. And I admired and respected Brother and Sister King so much, uh, every bit as much as I admired, and you all know what a big fan I was of Brother and Sister Gillum. Tommy and I went years ago, we went to a baby shower affair being held for my cousin. And the Kings happened to be her grandparents because her mother married one of their sons. My cousin married one of their sons. And they were at this gathering as well. And I had an opportunity to talk with them for a while and I told them, I said, you know folks, as I just want to tell you, I said, I have always, always felt that you folks are just top drawer. You're, you're top shelf. They don't make them any better than y'all. And, and God knows my heart. I meant that compliment as it couldn't have been any more sincere coming out of me for nothing. I meant every word I said to them that day. And Brother King and Sister King were standing there and they smiled and Brother King looked at me and he said, Chuck, he said, we've always thought you were top shelf too. Boy, I will tell you, that was a high compliment coming from them, but you see, there was somebody who didn't think they were perfect. There was somebody who was able to look at others in the church and see them as being better even than themselves. Do you follow what I'm saying? These are people who you could elevate them all you wanted to. You could compliment them all you wanted to. But honey, they just turned around and thought as highly of you and elevated you as, as highly as you did them. Do you follow what I'm telling you? Boy, you want to talk about as close to perfect as you can get. Well, sweetie, but you know what? If, if if you watch the way they live and you watch the way they act and you watch the way they talk, these people never acted like people who thought they were perfect. 
Do you follow what I'm telling you? They never, they didn't look down on anybody. They didn't criticize anybody. They didn't find fault with anybody. No, a humble heart, even a perfect heart, would never claim perfection. In James chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, the apostle, excuse me, the brother of Jesus, James, writes, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? In other words, it desires or it wants to envy or be jealous. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore, he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Envy is born of pride. A proud individual will envy what others have, as he or she feels, quote, less than their neighbor. My goodness, by reason of the fact they don't have what their neighbor does have. A humble heart does not envy. Humility is satisfied where it is at with what it already has. This humility is our greatest defense against the sin of envy. Friendship with the world, a term that literally we, we use the word worldliness, is manifested in our spirit by the desire to have in this world what others have. Not understanding how it is that they can have something we do not. The feeling that we are equally as worthy or deserving of that which our neighbor possesses is not a godly attribute. Hmm. My goodness. A humble heart acknowledges that God is in control of our lives and that He allows or gives us that which we need, that which we require, that which we are capable of possessing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes God doesn't give us certain things because if He did, He knows you'd squatter it away, you'd fritter it away, you'd lose it, you'd mess it up. If He chooses not to allow us the same pleasure or advantage as another, we ought humbly to accept this as His will and neither envy our neighbor or resent the Lord our God. I've had to sit back for years and work my tail to the bone trying to do a work for the Lord. I've, now, when I was in the mainstream before I came out in 1989, before I started affirming ministry in 1993, I used to be able to go into a community and start a church. And I mean to tell you, within a matter of months, we had 40, 50, 100 people. I've been in affirming ministry now for almost 30 years. Almost 30 years. It's hard for me to even fathom. And I can't get past the starting line. I literally cannot get past the starting line, folks. Every time I make two steps forward without fail, it feels like we go ten steps back. Can't get people to be part of the church. Can't get them to be faithful. Can't get them to be committed. Can't get them to love their pastor. Can't get them. I remember pastor in my first church, my overseer, Brother G.J. Chandler, in the Church of God. Brother Chandler told me one time, he said, Brother Morrow, said, man, I'm going to tell you something, son. I was 19 years old at the time. He said, I'm going to tell you something, son. He said, I've never seen a church in my life that loved their pastor more than your people love you. He said, I've never seen. He said, your people adore you. They absolutely. I'm going to tell you something. You get a church full of people that love their pastor, and I'm going to tell you, you're able to get some things done. Mm -hmm. 
when I resigned that church and left, and it was because I, I had the gay issue inside me, and I was struggling with it, and I was terrified I might one day, might one day do something stupid, and I didn't want to destroy the good work that I had begun. So I thought maybe it'd be a good idea for me to evangelize a while and not be in pastoral ministry for a while until I could find a wife because that'll fix me. That'll make everything right. You know, something magical about women, you know. They can fix the gay man in a flat second. Just something magical about it. So I resigned my first church, you know. And uh, I figured... I'd move into a different type of ministry and that would be better. And I wouldn't risk as much. Well, you know, the funny thing is, my grandmother, she was upset that I, that I resigned my first church. She didn't know the issues that I had. And she knew how quickly it had grown and how much it had prospered. And we had an incredible move of God in that church like you wouldn't believe. And I promise you, it was in spite of my imperfection. It was in spite of the confusion in my life and, you know, the stuff going on in my head. You know why? Because God is God and God right. is good. That's it right. wasn't about me. It was about Him. Amen. Yes. I wasn't doing what I was doing for me. I was doing it for Him. And I'm telling you, God's good. But I'm going to tell you, Grandma Bell, bless her heart, she got teary-eyed and said... Oh, you know, you're leaving because the people never shared your vision. And I looked at her and I said, Grandma, that couldn't be further from the truth. I said, that, that doesn't have nothing to do. That doesn't have nothing to do with me resigning. My people, the people of this church have always had my back. They've always loved me. They've always shared my vision. That is not the issue. But see, you know, that was her thought process. But you know what, now I've been in affirming ministry for almost three decades, and I watch other affirming churches, and, and most affirming churches struggle like we do. I've been in this line of ministry now, as I say, for almost 30 years. I have watched dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of affirming churches open and close since I've been in this line of ministry. Y'all say, well now you're preaching to no audience and all you've got is those of us watching on the internet. Yeah, but I've got that. i got news for you, honey. I could point you to dozens and dozens and dozens of preachers I know who are driving truck now, who are working in retail now, who are doing everything but ministry because they tried to do a work that was affirming of LGBT people and they went through the same struggle I go through and they quit. They couldn't take it. They gave up. They said, I'm tired of this. I don't understand. This church over here has a hundred people and this church over here has a couple hundred people. And there aren't very many affirming churches that have this, but there are a few. And they looked at that Tommy and they said, well, I don't understand why I can't have I don't understand why our church can't be like that. And have I been through moments of pity party like this? Yes, I have. I'd be lying if I said I didn't. But in the end, I think I can honestly say, and I think Tommy could, could verify that I have said on how many, how many occasions, but God knows what I can handle. God knows what He's doing. I don't know what He's doing. I don't understand why we don't have hundreds of people. I don't understand why we don't have a church full of people. I don't understand why things aren't different. But I'm not jealous or envious of others. Do you follow what I'm trying to tell you today? Why? Well, I'll tell you why. Because I have to maintain a godly humility and I have to acknowledge that if, if I believe God's in charge of my life and my ministry, then there's a reason why we're doing exactly what we're doing right now. I don't, may not know that reason, but my knowing it is not a prerequisite. My submitting myself to it is. Uh -huh. I've got to be humble enough to accept when conditions and circumstances are less than I'd like them to be. Does it thrill me? Not in the least. <laughs> 
Does my self-esteem go through some battles? Oh, yes, it does. But Paul said, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, meaning self-glorification. That's what vain glory means. First Peter 5, verses 5 through 7, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Once again, we hear Peter saying the identical same words as James in James 4 and 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. The Lord cannot and does not work with the proud. In fact, pride puts us in opposition to God, my Lord. If we are to experience all that the Lord desires for us, we must find a place of humility and submission. Anyone with a basic knowledge of Christian theology understands that Satan fell in response to pride. Mm -hmm. He was not happy to be in service of the Lord in the most unique and powerful position in all of creation. But he had it in his heart to literally usurp God so that he might sit in the throne of God and be worshipped as the Creator and not merely a creation. In Isaiah 14, 12 through 14, we read, how you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you, once, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly, on the utmost heights of Mount Zephon. I will ascend above the top of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. Now listen, I'm, my last page of notes here. This is some important stuff you need to understand as we reach the end of this age. The Antichrist is literally the physical embodiment of Lucifer's deepest desires. Did you hear what I just said? The Antichrist will be the physical embodiment of Lucifer, Satan's deepest desires. Mm -hmm. First, uh, Second Thessalonians 2, 1 through 4, the Word of God said, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So you see, the Antichrist is literally going to do in physical form what Satan was talking and thinking about doing prior to the fall. In Ezekiel 28, 1 through 10, the word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, 
Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus. This is speaking literally of Satan. Thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas. Yet thou art a man, meaning you're created. You're not the creator, you're created, and not God. Though thou set thine heart as the heart of God, Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. With thy wisdom and with thine understanding, thou hast gotten thee riches, and hast gotten gold and silver into thy treasures. By thy great wisdom and by thy traffic business, hast thou increased thy riches, and thine heart is lifted up, because of thy riches. Therefore thus saith the Lord, because thou hast set thine heart as the heart of God, behold therefore I, I will bring strangers upon thee, the terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of thy wisdom, and they shall defile thy brightness. They shall bring thee down to the pit, and thou shalt die the deaths of them that are slain in the midst of the seas. Wilt thou yet say before him that slayeth thee, I am God? He said, are you going to stand there and tell the people who are killing you that you're God? But thou shalt be a man and no God. This is referring to the Antichrist, the physical embodiment of Satan. In the hand of him that slayeth thee, thou shalt die the deaths of the uncircumcised by the hand of strangers, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. In his fervor to be as God, Satan will manifest himself in human form even as God manifested himself in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he is called the Antichrist. As it's not being against Christ, it literally means a counterfeit Christ. And it is in that human form that he shall be crushed and defeated, as well as all who submit to him and worship him as God. If ever a cautionary tale existed which should direct us away from pride and encourage us to humility, it is this tale. Mm -hmm. Satan saw himself as perfect. He could see nor find any fault whatsoever. But in that perception was the seed of his fall. Pride is the source of of the perception of perfection. If you perceive any holiness or any perfection in yourself, honey, then the source of that perception and that deception is pride. Mm -hmm. Pride is the greatest curse known to fallen man. There is nothing which has given way to or created more evil, more sin and destruction in our world than the sin of pride. If we are to successfully live for the Lord and realize the fullness of the blessing He has for us in this life, if we have any hope of seeing Him in that home called heaven, we must be certain to purge ourselves of the perception of perfection. The Apostle Paul declared in Romans 7, 24, O oh, wretched man that I am, a man who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. And he says, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body, from the body of this death? In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 54 through 57, Paul writes to the church at Corinth, So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. 
O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. In our primary text today, the Apostle Paul wrote to the Philippians and said, I don't count myself as having apprehended. I don't consider myself as having arrived. I don't consider myself perfect as though somehow I had laid hold on that which I pursue. He said, but I keep running. I keep pursuing it. I keep chasing it. Follow peace with all men and holiness. I keep running. I keep running. It's about running the race. In 1 Corinthians 9, 24 and 25, Paul writes, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. This literally means that ye may finish. How many people, I just saw a comedian the other day on television talking about running in the New York City Marathon. He said, did you win? He asked people, they said, oh, I ran in the marathon. I said, did you win? Well, no, I didn't win. He said, well, why'd you bother running? Because there is accomplishment and achievement in simply running the race. Some I tell the right. truth. Somebody else got the prize, but you ran in the marathon. How many people never even bothered to try to run a 26-mile marathon? You follow what I'm saying? Paul said, Know ye not that they that run in the race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. Run to finish. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. People that run in races in this life run to attain a corruptible crown. But we an incorruptible. The end of his life, and I'm closing my message right now. At the end of his life, the Apostle Paul wrote these words to Timothy, his son in the Lord, his apprentice as it were, his young charge. And the Apostle Paul said, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. Talk about running. Said I finished the course. Did I win the race? No, nope, but I finished the course. Hallelujah. I kept going after my goal. I kept going. I kept going till I hit that finish line. But listen, he said, I have kept the faith. What is the ultimate goal of God's people? What is the ultimate goal? of a child of God, is it perfection? No. It's keeping the faith. Right. A lot of people are losing their faith today. A lot of people are giving up on their faith in God. A lot of people are walking away from the Christian faith today, especially after the debacle that is Donald Trump and the way the church has fallen at his feet and worshipped him. I read an article just today or yesterday on the internet about uh, people are falling out of the church by the thousands right now because of what transpired between the evangelical church and the Trump cult. Paul said, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I didn't finish your course. I didn't finish your race. I didn't run your journey. I finished my course. And I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Paul said, they run for a crown that passes away. We run for a crown that doesn't pass away. Mm -hmm. What is that crown? A crown of righteousness. God is going to crown us with righteousness. God is going to crown us with holiness. God is going to crown us with perfection. Which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, 
but unto all them also that love his appearing. Satan is a deceiver. The biggest deception that he is using against God's people today is the deception of perfection. Making people believe they can be perfect. And that that is what God expects of them. In complete contrast to that, remember Jesus who for 40 days was tempted of the devil in the wilderness. He didn't tempt the Lord with the notion of perfection. No, 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 no. <laughs> he knew who he was dealing with. He tempted him the area of pride. He thought the same thing that brought him down could bring Jesus down. If you're who you say you are, you should be able to do this. I can give you all these kingdoms. I can give you all this. Do you see? It was pride. Pride. If you're, if you're who you say you are, then you should be able to talk to this stone and turn it to bread. Pride. The Lord looked at him and said, I have got nothing to prove to you. I don't have to prove nothing to you. I, you know good and well who I am, and I'd be an idiot if I sat here and felt like I had to prove myself to you when I know good and well. You believe there's one God, the Word of God said, even the demons believe and tremble. The devil knew who Jesus was. He didn't have to prove himself to the devil. Hello now. But instead, the Lord kept referring back to the Word of God, kept referring back to the Word of God, kept quoting the Word of God. Children, I want to tell you today, the perfect deception that is destroying God's church and destroying God's people today is the deception that you can be that you should be that you must be perfect mm -hmm. yeah. just got to run the race you got to be running in that direction you got to be running with that hope in your heart you got to be running with that expectation that one day I will be perfected. Hello now. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. The perfect deception. Would you stand with me this afternoon?